How many are first timers at one of these talks? We like to ask that every time. See, you know, more than half. That's right. That's great. Well, we do this. This is the last talk of our season, and so we'll take off the summer months and do something different. We're going to have Riverwalk guided tours down at the Falls Park Trail, and that's July through September that we do those. So I hope you pick up one of our schedules up on the table here, the round table out in the front in the front area. And so this, uh, these Riverwalk tours are fun. You get uh, us guides, local historians, guiding you through the core of downtown Tumwater, the Deschutes River down there in the falls. So that's throughout the summer and then we'll start the monthly history talks here again in October in another season, and so we have a schedule for some of that on the table also. And the other tours we do are guided tours of the Schmidt House. Uh, this house was built in 1904, and then this extension that we're sitting in was 1910. Leopold and Johanna Schmidt uh, built it for the original brewery and the brewery family. And uh, Bob Krim, back who's standing in the back, is our guide for the house tours that we give. He's worked for the Schmidt family for almost 60 years, and he has all kinds of great stories that he tells. But you need to be able to handle the stairs, because we have three stories up, and then there's a full basement down below with their archives, and so you'll have to be in, in shape in order to do that tour. But it's, it's, it's worth it if you can. Um, so we have um, exits. We, you see this exit here in case... Uh, in case Dick gets on fire, we'll have to run out that way. And then our front door, and then there's a door by the kitchen also. So um, that's, that's this. what else? Oh, and, and if you, our most popular room on the whole tour is the one you may want to use later on, and that's that little tiny bathroom under the stairway. Uh, we have that under, under the front stairs. And then you can also go upstairs and turn to the right, and there's a nice bathroom you don't have to bend over in <laughs> because that little stairway, that little bathroom's cute, actually. And uh, we want to make sure you turn off your um, Pioneer cell phones and smartphones and those kind of things that beep and make noises uh, so that we can have a, a good talk. And TCTV, you can see they're getting ready to film this. Well, well it's not film anymore. Digitalize, video it. <laughs> Capture it, <laughs> okay, and then that will be on the TCTV Tumwater Channel 26 in about a month for, for Dick's talk here, so uh, that's coming up. Okay, I think I've covered most of that caretaking stuff. Uh, I have two careers. Uh, one is uh, uh, radio, and I'm still in a radio station myself. I, I work at KACS in Chehalis. It's an, an FM station, 90.5 FM. So that's my, one of my jobs. That's been my career. Uh, in fact, I work for Dick Poost. You were my boss for a little while. So uh, anyway, but we're cohorts now. But anyway, I, I, I work that, but then half time I'm here as a public history manager for the Olympia Tumwater Foundation here with offices upstairs in this, in this house. Pretty nice surroundings. And uh, of course, history has been my hobby for, for many years being related to Trosper Road. So it was only natural that I should end up working in history too. So I've got two jobs, they're both fun and I get paid for both. So it's pretty nice, pretty good arrangement. But, um, uh, the uh, career, my high school days, I was looking for, a, for a, a career, what to do with my life, and I saw one of those TV commercials for a radio broadcasting course, a correspondence course, and they say, how would you like my job? And I said, yeah. <laughs> it sounded really romantic and exciting. <laughs> and, and so I, did, I started to take that correspondence course, and part of that, they had me uh, go visit a local radio station, and so I went down to the waterfront in 1240 KGY, Met, met people like Don Jones, who took me under his wing. I met some of the DJs and uh, the newsmen and the sports guys and the salespeople and everything. So it was just a, a good way to get introduced to radio. And that's where I met the eventual program director and station manager of KGY, Dick Poost. He was still the morning guy and has been for many years. In fact, uh, let me ask how many remember uh, turning on to KGY on snow days? To <laughs> Everybody heard your voice on that. And, and then uh, I should confess something, that I had a station in Tumwater at the time, too, and on snow days, I would even turn into Dick in order to get this, the real scoop so I could put it on our station, too. So I cheated a little bit because of your expertise. Um, also, uh, how many called the station treating it like an information source, like a visitor convention bureau? <laughs> Do you know where such and such is in town? You know, the secretaries had to know an awful lot. Uh, did you tune in for Bob McLeod local election results? Yeah, sure. How about, uh, <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, how about uh, listen to your kid playing high school sports with Dick Nichols, maybe mentioning your kid's name on the air? Yeah, that's right. And uh, Ken has been on the air too, KGY, hasn't he? Ken's Corner. <laughs> Ken's Corner, that's right. Uh, and then let's see what else. Um, contests, special promotions like Lake Fair, all those things you turn into KGY for. 
So I'd venture to say that the voice you most recognize, though, is Dick Pust. And I would like to have a warm welcome and a warm hug for Dick Pust right now. <laughs> welcome. Well, uh, Don mentioned that he worked at KGY for a while. At the same time, we had somebody else working there by the name of Tom Trotzer, who was another announcer and also our chief engineer. And if you can just think for a moment, working in a small business with a Don Trosper and a Tom Trotzer. I mean, after a while, your brain just kind of tangles up and you it, it just... So, so we weren't glad that you left, Don, but it simplified things a whole lot, I want you to know. And, and Don was great to work with and uh, a fellow broadcaster, and we understand uh, each other's business a lot. It, it, it's an honor to be here. I didn't think anybody would show up, but I see we're you know, way out there in the hinterlands. There are, there are two seats in front, and I guess the running joke is nobody wants to sit on the front row, and there are a couple others up here, so if you... If you're stuck in the back or standing and, and want a place to sit, don't be afraid to, to come up front. You'll probably end up, uh, uh, Dan uh, uh, Bennett will probably have you on TCTV if you walk by the camera, but that's okay. It's, it's okay. And this will be archived, as mentioned, and uh, this is a first for me. I have never done a, a, a shall we say, an intellectual <coughs> presentation before, and, and some, uh, some of you are laughing at that. Uh, John Halverson, former Lacey mayor, uh, good to have you here. Mark Fouch, uh, uh, historian and former Olympia mayor, sitting right over there. And uh, Charlie Barron, who is uh, chair of the uh, Salvation Army Advisory Board. Uh, their Sal Salvation Army is celebrating its 125th year in Olympia. 125 years, one of the, one of the oldest. And uh, so it's, it's just a, an honor to be with you today because I'm doing something a little different. Uh, one time the Olympian covered one of my talks and they, uh, John Dodge said I, was, I gave a rambling talk. So I'm trying to remedy that this time. And uh, it's just an honor to be here today to actually do a little history, which I inadvertently got into. This is my diary, one of my sources I started this when I was 19 years old. It's kind of beat up. People say, Dick, did you take that with you to basic training in the Army? Yep, sure did. I took it with me everywhere, and I have not, I've kept my diary every day since 1959. So a lot of my material comes from that. And I encourage people to keep a diary. You'd be uh, surprised at how some of times your memories are inaccurate, and you read, read it in the diary, and it isn't how you remembered it. I didn't uh, realize that I was a part of history until well into my career. Uh, eventually it dawned on me that I was working, well, first of all, it was unusual for someone to stay on the job for as long as I did, uh, over 50 years in one spot, which, which is really kind of unusual, but that's not enough. The fact that I worked for a historic radio station, which I didn't really recognize the significance of, was something that kind of occurred to me late in life. So historically, KGY was very important. Uh, Darlene put on History of KGY Radio, and this is going to be a little more than that. And by the way, I want to thank Darlene Kemery, who's right here. She is my producer and put this uh, uh, together. Without Darlene, I couldn't do a PowerPoint. Don asked me to do this presentation. He said, Dick, I want a PowerPoint. And I go, ah, <laughs> I've never done one of those before, Don. So uh, fortunately, I knew someone who could do it. And also, Don kind of threw me off a little bit when he said, uh, Dick, why don't you speak for 15, 15 min minutes? And I said, oh, 15 minutes? The Olympian says no longer than 19 minutes for a talk. I just happened to read an article on that, never talk longer than, I think it was 18 minutes. And Don said, oh, I want you to talk for 50 minutes, 5-0, and then 10 minutes of questions afterwards. And then TCTV says this is exactly an hour that they take care of. So KGY, I'm going to give you some boring statistics at the start, or maybe they're not so boring. KGY was one of the first 40 radio stations licensed in the United States. Got its license in 1922, April the 5th. Today... To put things into perspective, 
There are 11,300 radio stations approximately in the United States. That's, that's approximate. 82 AM and FMs just in the Seattle six county metro area. Eight stations licensed here in Thurston County right now. See how many you recognize. KBRD, known as KBird, 680 on, on the dial. They're licensed to Lacey. They play, play some really old music. KGTK, anybody listen to that one? 920 on your dial, they've been here a while. The old KQ92 and KITN. KBUP, 1240 on your dial, the old KGY. KLDY, 1280, Spanish language broadcasting. KUOW, 1340, Don's old K vision. KAOS, Chaos, 89.3, still doing their original format out of the Evergreen State College. KPLI FM 90.1. I didn't even know that station was here until I researched it. I had to listen to them the other day. They're actually a repeat of KPLU, uh, uh, Pacific Lutheran University station. And then uh, the most powerful radio station, KXXO FM 96.1. And I work for them right now, do a program called It's Your Community every Sunday morning at 9. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. They're celebrating their 25th birthday this year. So those are the stations. Who did I leave out, Dick? Well, I didn't mention Roxy, did I? KRXY? They're actually uh, licensed to Shelton, Mason County Station, even though they have their studios on State Avenue at, on the east side. And I uh, didn't mention uh, KO or their actual call letters, KYYO. It used to be KGYFM. They're licensed to McClary. There is no KGY Olympia any longer. The format exists on 95.3, which is a very low power 136 watt translator station located in Tumwater. You find out the identity of a radio station by listening at the top of the hour when they're required to give their station ID. The old KGY format, 95.3, is actually, if you listen at the top of the hour, it's kind of complicated. KYYOHD2K237FR Tumwater. And uh, it is actually owned by uh, South Sound Broadcasting of Bellevue, according to uh, FCC uh, uh, reports. So those are some, uh, shall we say, boring statistics. Also, I should mention that the KGY call letters, extremely unique, very rare, and once given up, can never be returned. So when KGY was sold to uh, uh, the uh, Sacred Heart Radio, the Catholic broadcasters, for a while, for a few weeks, the call letters were KGY Olympia. And then all of a sudden that disappeared and it came, became KBUP. I happened to find the uh, name of the uh, new manager who lives in, I think, Issaquah or someplace up in the Seattle area. And I called him, his name is Ron Belter, and I said, what did you, why did you give up the KGY call letters? You're a Catholic organization. The station was founded on St. Martin's uh, campus, and now the Catholics have it back. Why would you give up the KGY call letters? And he said, well, I understand, but he said it was, it was an agreement we had with the previous owners that we would get some other call letters. So we got KBUP, which means absolutely nothing, but those are our call letters. So KGY call letters are gone forever. But they existed for, I think, 92 years. So that's a long time to be a history. Uh, besides its historical impact, KGY is important because of its impact on the community. For 35 years, roughly, KGY was the only local radio station in this area. The only one. 35 years is a long time. KITN came on in the uh, mid-50s. Don't know the exact time. And actually, that was my first radio job at KITN. I was a janitor and uh, just out of high school. KITN was located on Columbia Street, a very, very small studio, uh, oh, not much bigger than the rooms that we're in right now, just this whole area. 
But most importantly, they had their DJs in the window, kind of the show window, and they had live DJs doing modern music right there in the showroom. And it was a thrill to me. They were a daytimer, so they had to go off the air after sundown, and that's when I did my janitorial. But just being around where a DJ actually stood and did the show was just really a thrill to me. So from probably the 30s through uh, the 70s, KGY was the dominant connection to the community. That's a long time, about 60 years, everyone was connected to Olympia. It was uh, to KGY. Literally thousands of people actually appeared on KGY. Many of you probably have stories about your experience on KGY. KGY's microphone was open to a lot of people. We did really local programming, things like doggone news. I did many of those. There was a little arf, 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 and then you'd talk about Mary Smith's poodle ran away this morning, and uh, she's wearing a collar, and uh, she, ha she limps a little bit, and she was last seen on State Avenue headed, headed west. And sure enough, someone would see the dog, call up Mary Smith and say, we found your dog, and, and the dog would, I mean, these, this was not just wasted time. It was a really public service. And we did programs like the bulletin board, which is sort of like a free want ad service. You could, you know, we'd say you had a, you know, an old rocking chair for sale and someone would buy it. Probably the best known thing we did was high school sports. Dick Nichols. Everybody listened to Dick Nichols do high school sports. And there weren't very many schools. Well, at one time there was only one, Olympia High School, but when I uh, came on board, that was Olympia High, uh, Tumwater High, and North Thurston. And it was only boys' sports that were broadcast. So you rallied around a very few teams, and it was pretty exciting. It was, we didn't have Seahawks or Mariners, and, and so it was high school sports. That was very, very big. But most of all, and if I'm famous at all, it's for one thing, not being mayor of Olympia, not being mayor of Lacey, not being an intellectual, I told you when school was going to be closed. <laughs> That's what everybody remembers. And I'll go down in history as the guy they listened to to find out whether there was school that day. People listen to radio for companionship. I never considered myself a good DJ. In fact, I replaced a guy by the name of Charlie Bird. I don't know if anybody remembers Charlie, but he was really, really popular. And uh, he was afraid when he would go on vacation, I was kind of lined up to do his show while he was away, and he was always afraid I was going to ruin his show. Charlie passed away a number of years ago, and he was a dear friend of mine, and went up to Seattle Radio after he left us. And he was very, very talented, and there were a lot of folks that when I'm writing a book on KGY, and most of the material is not in this talk, but I've written a couple of chapters. One was about my uh, cohort, P.J. Kirkland, who died earlier this year. And uh, fortunately, I was able to visit him at Mother Joseph's a number of times before he passed away, and he and, and Mark Fouch were, were best friends, and... Uh, and uh, it's a great loss, but that's one of the first chapters I've written in my book. Whether it ever gets published or not, I have no idea. So I've broken this down. John Dodge is not here, but I'm better organized this time. I'm not going to ramble, I hope. So we're, we're going to go to the KGY's very first studio. And I call it the outhouse. Oh, 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 my, thank goodness I have a producer here. I have to back up just a little bit here, so sorry, John Dodge, I am rambling after all. Okay, that's a picture of me, and I'm getting a radio for, uh, for Christmas. And I'm also looking to see where the page that I have that... Uh, <laughs> Tells me about that. I, I do remember the radio. Okay, I will just say, uh, before I get to the outhouse, <laughs> or thrown in the outhouse, that I put that on my uh, bed stand, nightstand, and I was about 15 years old in that picture. And that's at my home out on Cooper Point. 
and uh, I got a clock radio for Christmas. Remember that? I remember hearing it click on to KGY a little before uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, and it was Ray Harris doing country music. And I remember one time Ray Harris was playing one of my favorite songs, and Ray Harris stopped it in the middle, took the radio, uh, record off the turntable, broke it, and said, that is a piece of junk. <laughs> I thought, what? How can you do that? But anyway, that, that's an example. My family listened to uh, uh, the 7 o'clock news. We um, listened to Frank Hemingway on the news, the Breakfast Club, and there was local news in there. Thank you, Darlene, for keeping me on track. And now we go to the outhouse. That is KGY's first studio. Yeah, thanks for noticing that. That little, uh, that is not a rip in the page. That is the uh, tower, I guess you'd call it, an antenna. KGY started out as, a, as an amateur station, really. Father Sebastian probably did it as a hobby, and that was, that was pretty much the extent of it. But it, actually, it sort of evolved into what became KGY, which, as I mentioned earlier, got its license in 1922. Uh, before it got its license, though, Father Sebastian would be, uh, shall we say, experimenting with programs. He had uh, Ralph Cater actually squeezed in there with his accordion and did a program with him. And he brought in somehow a woman from Tacoma. I can't remember her name right off, but uh, she played a harp, and I assume it was one of those bigger ones. And somehow they got that in there, too. But... KGY was unique. It wasn't KGY then. It was Father Sebastian's W7YS. But he was putting on so many programs, and it was getting so much coverage in the newspapers in Tacoma and, and Olympia that a federal inspector said, uh, you know, Father Sebastian, you better get a license or you're going to have to shut this thing off. So he applied, and uh, knowing how long bureaucracy uh, takes, it took two weeks before he got his license. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, he went through the whole federal system and application process, and two weeks later, there he is. Five watts of power, and the call letters KGY. Wow. KGY could be heard in 20 states, over 20 states, Canada and Hawaii. Now, I'm assuming that the reception wasn't all that great way out on the distance, but it was pretty good down in Oregon and up in Canada, up in British Columbia. I mean, it's just like, like local. And one of the most popular programs was an opera series. <laughs> Can't imagine that drawing big ratings now. But every other week, Father Sebastian picked an opera. And he picked one in particular that was really popular called Carmen. And he ran that on Friday, June 2nd, 1922. And a listener in Newburgh, Oregon, by the name of J.C. Lemon, wrote... Came in clear as a bell. We could hear it well all over the house. It was great. And other programs were listened uh, equally well, loud and clear. Of course, there wasn't any interference back then, not very many radio stations. A radio station in Pittsburgh, KDKA, claimed to have the very first opera series, but Father Sebastian says, absolutely not. We had it four months before they did. This little outhouse, though, very innovative. Remember, it's on the St. Martin's campus. Not sure exactly where. A little more research would probably tell me. But not too far away was the St. Martin's High School, a boys' high school. And on February 28th, 1922, they still didn't have their license yet. They didn't get their license until, what I say, April? So they, Father Sebastian was kind of thumbing his nose a little bit at the federal authorities, I think. But anyway... The, uh, I, I'm sorry, February 28, 1922, they did a remote for the Olympia Elks Club. I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. The Olympia Elks downtown had an open house. And from 8.30 to 11, they, they didn't have their license during this time, Father Sebastian pointed out. But at the Elks Club, they set up speakers inside the building. And uh, 
Father Sebastian broadcast special music to the Olympia Elks. And at 11 o'clock, he played Old Lang Syne, and everybody had a toast, and that was it. Now, getting back to what I was saying uh, about a football game, November 1922, the first play-by-play, -play, sort of, say, uh, was came from this building. Father Sebastian ran a 100-yard line down to the football field, a phone line, 100 yards, uh, and put it on a truck. And the announcer, if you would call him that, the person covering the game was on, a, I assume, a flatbed and moved up and down the sidelines of the football field and phoned in the action to Father Sebastian, who repeated it over the air. It was the University of Washington freshman versus St. Martin's in the uh, University of Washington clobbered St. Martin's. Can't remember the score, but it was pretty one-sided. Anyway, somebody up in uh, Canada listening on a yacht up in British Columbia said it came in loud and clear, and he was a husky, so he was thrilled to death. <laughs> well, let's move on to the log cabin. KGY is really progressing. The next studio is this one. Now, that looks a little bit decrepit, but it was actually pretty nice. KGY was there from 1925 to 1932, 30 by 30 foot building. It had scatter rugs on the floor, wicker chairs. There was a receptionist with a phone in one corner. The equipment was in the other corner. There was a nice cozy fireplace, which was burning during the winter time, and uh, they brought in a lot of school kids and stuff and uh, could hold up to, like I say, about 30 people. Lots of local talent, and one in particular was a state trooper by the name of Red West. He'd pop in during one of the re programs called Request Night, and he'd come in, and as Father Sebastian described it, he'd uh, take off his ha brimmed hat, take off his gloves, warm himself by the fire for a little bit, and say... And what can I sing for you tonight? And then the phone would ring, and it was, I don't know, Irish stuff, usually. Uh, My Wild Irish Rose was one of his favorites. I assume he must have had a really good baritone voice or something and sang that. And then afterwards, according to Father Sebastian, he'd uh, kind of warm himself by the fire again, put his gloves back on and his hat back on, and... You could hear his motorcycle rumbling away, and as Father Sebastian said, presumably to go write tickets out on the road somewhere. They had another uh, really popular program on Sunday night called, uh, they had it arranged like a restaurant, which I think is a really cool idea. They didn't have computers to bring up songs like they do today, so Father Sebastian would list 20 songs on the menu, and then you'd call up and request a song. And then someone acting like a waitress would come up and say, Father Sebastian, uh, we have a request for such and such. And then he'd play that song from among the 20. Kind of a cool idea. I think somebody ought to come up with that again. They were also able to do uh, remotes, uh, apparently uh, via phone, because according to Gordon Newell's uh, Rogues, Buffoons, and Statesmen, KGY broadcast Governor Roland Hartley's address to the Olympia Chamber of Commerce live from the Hotel Olympian in 1925. And he kept a log. There were a lot of visitors. It was a pretty unusual place. So he kept a log book from 1932 to, or excuse me, from 1925 to 1932. And during that time, 3,954 people visited that little building. That's a lot of folks. And according to Father Sebastian, many of them took pictures, and they used these cameras where, where you would... Um, it would be a little explosion on a little tin can or little whatever you called it. But that's how they got their flash bulb. And he said the place was so full of smoke at times you'd have to leave because, well, you couldn't breathe in there. And you just wonder and wish that some of those many, many pictures were still around somewhere. So hopefully during this presentation, maybe some of you will know some of these things and can... Get me some more information. I'm just really hungry for that. I'd love to put it in my book or just show it at another presentation. It was a one-man show, pretty much, with Father Sebastian throughout the entire career that he had the station. Until 1930, Phil and Hilda Fryer joined the staff. Phil did engineering. Hilda answered the phones. The last broadcast from there was 
May 8th, 1932, the station was sold to uh, Archie Taft and moved to Capitol Way. Don't have any old pictures of that, but uh, that'd be page eight. Uh, and um, we, were, we were going to the Capitol Park building. I took this picture a few days ago. I think that's the Capitol Park building. I walked clear around it, couldn't find the word Capitol Park on there, the words Capitol Park on there anywhere, but it is a building at 11th and Capitol Way, and I'm pretty sure the KGY studios were in that building. That's gonna to be torn down soon, I understand, and the new State Patrol headquarters is going to be there. Not a whole lot known about the programming there, except that's from my mother's diary, 1937. Up at the top, you'll see, uh, I think it says uh, Friday, and she says G and I, uh, well, you can almost read it, I think. A anyway, my mother mentions KGY. She did a half-hour program on Friday, another one on Saturday. And the really bad thing is, I remember my mother mentioning being on KGY, but I never asked her about it. So I never said, what was it like? What did you do? What were the circumstances? And now my mother's passed away. I can't ask those questions. And how many of you go through the same experiences? Now you think of the question. Now. So why didn't you ask it earlier? I notice we're uh, mostly, a, shall we say, an older crowd. And it seems like you don't really appreciate history until you get older. I don't know why that is. Maybe because you lived it or something. But ask those questions. So she did uh, quite a few of those shows, and uh, uh, she and Gertrude, whoever Gertrude was, and then she also sang with a group called the Silver Chord. Don't know anything about it. But we do know a lot about the next person here, Sam Crawford. Sam Crawford originated news basically here in the Northwest, not just at KGY, but the entire Washington state. They didn't have such a thing as local news until Sam Crawford more or less invented it, invented it. He was news director at KGY from 1934 until 1951, 17 years as news director. And, and uh, he was a two-fingered newscaster. He typed away with uh, one finger on one hand and another on another, and he could type faster than anybody who, who did regular typing. I got to know Sam a little bit. He grew up basically in Fairbanks, Alaska, and paid a visit to there uh, not too long before he died, and uh, was uh, interviewed by the Fairbanks, Alaska Daily News Miner on August 26, 1972. Sam Crawford is quoted as saying, there wasn't any local news on radio in those days. I had to nuke a job for myself and did at KGY in Olympia, the state capital. I guess I had about the first local news operation in the state, the only other radio newscasts were from the networks. Well, Sam Crawford, the man, was born in 1890, so he'd be 125 years old if he was still around today. He lived till he was 87, grew up in, or died in 1977. Grew up in a log cabin in Fairbanks, the only two-story log cabin in Fairbanks around the turn of the century. That's the, between 1800 and 1900s. In 1911, he went to the University of Washington after that, he worked uh, as a reporter for newspapers in Chehalis and Bremerton and served in the uh, World War I in the U.S. Coast Guard. And his son, Bob Crawford, died in World War II. He was a submariner, was uh, out rescuing uh, down flyers, and the Japanese saw him and bombed the submarine, and he died. Sam Crawford then went into a period of depression. And his grandson, Richard Sanders, who is Richard here today by any chance, he said he might, might come here. I ran into him not too long ago, and that's where I'm getting this information. Richard said he benefited by getting a lot of attention, extra attention from his grandpa. And uh, one of the most interesting things about Sam was his brother, Robert Crawford, who lived in Centralia. He wrote the Army Air Corps hymn, Off we go into the wild blue yonder, that was his brother who wrote that. Sam Crawford was with KGY for 38 years. And uh, there he is being interviewed by Tom Olson, who bought the radio station in 1939. And uh, Sam left news in 1951 to do sales. 
And uh, I rem his grandson reminded me of a program that he did, a special program, while he was in the sales department, which was on the air, but definitely tied to sales. Lesnick News, a uh, business in Olympia, distributed all the magazines in town. So Sam would get a sample of those magazines every week and do a weekly uh, review of them. About 15 minutes, he'd talk about in Life magazine this week, you can get, or in Time magazine, kind of interesting. And uh, Sam's uh, grandson, uh, Richard Sanders, says he remembers all those stacks of magazines in his grandpa's house. My memories start on this next picture. That is one of the last taken of Sam Crawford that I've seen. He was in the uh, KGY studios, where it is now, upstairs and uh, reading the newspaper. And I am assuming Sam was well into his 80s when this was taken. He couldn't see very well, so he's got the paper up real close. But he was still selling time for KGY radio. And I remember how nervous we'd get when we'd see him uh, get into his car and just barely uh, get into his car and drive off to, to see a client. And you'd hope that Sam made it back. And he did. And Sam took a liking to me, he and his wife Lassie. And uh, uh, he invited uh, my uh, young wife Pam and I over to his house for dinner, which I didn't realize that at the time but I was being invited to dinner by a very historical person. And he lived on uh, the old Oregon Trail Road. Anybody know where that is? A few of you do. I had to rediscover it recently. It's a road that goes down to Capitol Lake. You can barely find it. It's on the other side of the freeway. And you, you drive down a road that's one lane, basically. And, and down near the bottom was his house. And that's where we had dinner. And I don't remember what we talked about. I just remember that Sam took a liking to me and Lassie was so nice, his wife. And what impressed me was, he said, see that grown, that huge fir tree out in front? That was a living Christmas tree at one time. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was planted in honor of, of his son who had died in World War II. But what impressed me was that here I was looking at a tree that was once a little tree and now was a huge fir tree, and I thought, wow, this guy is really old. How long do you have to live to see a tree mature like that? So that's my memory of Sam. And I want to move along quickly here to the Rockway Leland Building. I t took this picture uh, not too long ago. Uh, that's the old KGY Studios. It was built in 1941. And you can see now that it's uh, owned by KXXO FM, the studios, and uh, Mix 96.1 is there, and that's where I, I am currently working. I started there in 1959, and if you've ever been in those studios, you walk up a long flight of stairs. And uh, when I was a kid, I bounded up those stairs two and three at a time, and now I drag myself up one step at a time and I'm really sure to hold the handrails when I go down because it's a long flight of stairs. But I got there, uh, started there as the receptionist in 1959, a big dollar an hour. That was minimum wage probably. So that's how the building, what you're looking at now, is how the building looked in the 50s. And if uh, next uh, it will be another picture of the same building. That is the same building, how it looked in the 50s with the tower on the roof. Another clever way to get you to listen to the radio because with the tower on the roof and the stoplight down below, for some reason, AM signals pretty much dominated all the way across the dial. So while you're waiting for the light to change, you had to listen to KGY. If you were trying to listen to Seattle, that's tough. <laughs> you, you, you were being drowned out by KGY. The next picture shows uh, the uh, studio inside, it was quite elaborate, uh, grand piano, I, I, well, baby, what is it? Anyway, it was big piano. And uh, the next one shows people actually singing around it. I think I know a couple, three of those people, but I'm not really sure. Uh, President Truman uh, was at the radio station, uh, supposedly in uh, 1948, June the 9th, he paid a visit to Olympia. That's a historical fact, but he, I am told that he went to the radio station to make an address to send down to San Francisco. 
I don't know if anybody took any pictures or not. They should have. I have never seen a photo of that. And if anybody ever finds one, please share it with me. Now I want to show you something from behind here. This is my high school annual from 1955. Inside is this picture. That is not me. The person in the middle there is Ed Walk. He uh, went on to uh, run Olympia Federal Savings, and um, that's in that yearbook. I was, he was good. I was, you know, I didn't, I was barely past broadcasting class, so I didn't show up in any pictures. But KGY did a, two programs at that time when I went to Olympia High back in the 50s. One was high school headlines, which I suspect this is, and another was a dedication night uh, which uh, was in its 12th year, excuse me, High School Headlines was in its 12th year at this time. But there was also a request night where you'd, uh, kids from Olympia High would make record requests to other kids. You know, it'd be, be like, John Loves Mary and that kind of stuff. And so there'd be a crew of us pulling the records out of the record slots, at, and Don Jones, I'm sure, was pulling his hair out as we kids just invaded the studios. But that program ran Monday nights from 7 p.m. to 10.15 p.m. And it was a thrill to, uh, to uh, be a part of that. And when, when it was my turn to get up to the microphone, wow, that was, that was really something else I could say. And now this one goes out to Ken Balsley. I'm just joking here, but okay, now back to a modern day. My producer, who I couldn't live without at uh, Mix 96, Jennifer Mathis, who does just a, an amazing job of making me sound better, actually making me sound, bad programs sound good, but Jennifer swears up and down the building is haunted and that she has actually seen ghosts there. And she swears, she'll tell me that with a straight face, that she's seen ghosts and heard ghosts walking through the building. They are not departed DJs, however. She said there was a brothel nearby, and it's the madam that worked in the building next door. So you'll have to ask Jennifer all about that, because she knows. Moving, I'm going to have to move rather quickly here. I didn't think I'd have enough uh, time to fill. Back to the present building. That's an amazing uh, building. Uh, was advertised as the most unusual location for a radio. Well, in fact, it says one of America's most uniquely situated broadcasting companies. Why did KGY move there? It had really nice studios at the Rockway Leland Building. Well, KITN, amazingly, takes credit for it. Don Whitman, the owner of Kitten, said, said that, uh, and I, I read a letter where he actually said this, but I can't find the letter, so I can't do exact quotes, but the essence of it was that, that uh, Tom Olson built this radio station to run him, Don Whitman, out of business because he knew that Don Whitman couldn't afford a luxury place like this and if he had a spectacular location for a business, no one would even notice Don Whitman and Don was kind of ticked off about that. He didn't like that very well because Don had a 500 watt day timer. Tom Olson had a 24 hour license, although he didn't run it 24 hours a day. And um, Don Whitman played contemporary music, and then Tom Olson played uh, old fogey music. And uh, so uh, KITN was gaining on him. So we moved to the port. And this is where we ended up. Let's see if I can make this thing work. That's where KGY is, still is today. You don't recognize anything else, do you? There's no uh, Marine Drive, there's no Swantown Marina, there's no restaurant. This is Washington Street. Kind of a decrepit old road that went through. Isn't that an amazing picture? That's where I worked. I was there when they moved in. And uh, kind of spooky down there. It was uh, really an interesting, interesting place. And right to the left of KGY, as you're looking at it, was a creosote plant. I still love the smell of creosote. The old pole plant ended up being one of the most uh, polluted areas in the entire state, <clears throat> if not the most. Maybe one of the most polluted areas in the nation, I don't know. But right now, you can. Uh, there's a parking lot on top of the uh, pole site because it is so polluted they can't do anything with the property other than cover it over with a mound of stuff 
and there's a parking lot on top. So it's safe to be there if you don't build your house there, I guess. Tom Olson had a lot of uh, influence, though. He made that into a famous address. Somehow he got that named. Uh, or the, the frequency place on the dial was 1240. He got the address to be 1240 North Washington Street, very well-known address. The phone number was Whitehall 1240, or 943 1240. Tried to get the post office box to be 1240, but somebody wouldn't give it up, so he had to settle with uh, 1249. Uh, the uh, next picture is the building a little closer. You notice that the uh, deck runs all the way around on the first floor. It wasn't too long before they uh, remodeled a little bit and had to expand over that so you couldn't walk around. But when I started there, you could walk clear around the radio station on the, uh, on the uh, uh, side. During high tide, people would come by. Oh, that's the inside, the amazing uh, sales department with the uh, modern typewriters and and uh, we had four lines coming in on those phones. We had a fantastic view. We could see the mothballed uh, World War II ships out our window, and uh, occasionally a whale would go by, and the uh, spectacular departure and arrival of ships. And uh, we'll move on quickly to the grand opening scenes. Uh, that's me. You can just barely see me inside. I'm, that's my work attire. I'm wearing a white uh, sport jacket and a bow tie and a white shirt. Uh, that's, that's how people went to work in those days, even radio guys. There were uh, some challenges. Let's, let's show a few more pictures. That's Tom Olson in his office upstairs. And then uh, the next picture is me at the controls. I want to tell you some challenges to working in such a unique place. For one thing, it was roasting hot in the summertime and freezing cold in the wintertime. Believe it or not, some of you uh, folks can remember, we actually got down to seven below zero at one time. It is so cold that your feet just, you can hardly stand it in there, even with little space heaters. Invariably, our pipes would freeze up. No matter whether we left the water running or not, the pipes would always freeze up every winter, and we'd had no water in the building at all. So what'd you do for a bathroom? Well, <laughs> there was always the railing. <laughs> you just hoped, you just hoped nobody had binoculars watching from across the bay. There, there was only uh, one entrance to the station, uh, a walkway. And that was uh, really just ripe for somebody to play a prank on. One time, the Olympia High School, one of the classes, graduating classes, filled the entire walkway with tires. The station wasn't on the air 24 hours a day, so after we went off the air at night, they filled it up with tires, and so when I showed up for work, I couldn't get in. There was no way. It was stuffed. You have no idea. It was a truckload of tires. And the only way I could get in was to sneak around the side. I had to hang on the outside of the railing and inch myself along overlapping waves of the water below and uh, climb back over the railing and let myself through the front door. That was the only way in or out. I ignored the whole thing when I started my show that morning. Didn't say a word. Not one <laughs> word. Meantime, some of the staff had pulled away the tires, but... Later on, towards the end of my show, somebody called up, a very young voice, said, Dick, did you notice anything different when you came to work this morning? <laughs> no, what? <laughs> kind of got my revenge in a way. <laughs> One time, uh, some logs broke loose. And that kind of a building is not a good place to be when you get the big logs banging against them. A strong north wind. And the logs, bang, bang, bang. One time a whole bunch of them got loose. And it was so bad, I swear, I thought the building was going to cave. They were, the water was just, the high tide and the water just lashing and the logs hitting. The, and my show, I was trying to do my show and the records were jumping around on the turntable. I called the Olympia Police Department. They came rushing down and said, wow, don't know what we can do about it. <laughs> Not our problem. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't knock the station down, and the, one of the little tugboats came by after a while, and things calmed down during daylight. Another time, uh, a fire broke out in the pole yard, 
which at that time was even closer to KGY. It was like just right outside the, the, the side window almost. And the flames were just reaching into the sky. Bob McLeod was news director at that time. We got a, an extension to our uh, uh, mic line and Bob went up to the second floor and he did a live play-by-play -play of the pole yard flyer. Hey, we weren't gonna leave that place. We're dedicated broadcasters. I like this next picture the best because this describes, this describes how I did much of my work. I think Carl Cook took this picture. I'm not 100% sure, but it looks like something Carl would have taken. He, he was very good at specialty programs, and this is KGY at night. And when I started there, I was uh, the one who locked up the station. My program ended at 11, and I signed off. And it was my job to uh, lock up the station. And I was always worried that I'd leave it unlocked. I think I checked every door 10 times, and one time I think I was halfway up Harrison Hill on the way home, and I thought, did I lock the door? And I had to turn around and come back and check it. Because you, you saw where it was down in the port area. I mean, it was pretty isolated. Anybody could have gone down there, but that never happened. And then from 1967 to 1978, for about 11 years, I opened the station in the morning. And it was always before daylight, almost always because I'd do my rounds, do the police beat and all that kind of stuff, and I'd show up at the station about 4.30 in the morning, about an hour before we signed on. So it was still dark. And uh, so that's how the station looked to me. Kind of, sometimes it was kind of spooky. I'd be walking up the walkway there, and a, a, one of those herons, I don't know if you've ever heard the noise they make, but it's pretty loud. And they'd be maybe sleeping down there, and I'd disturb them, and they'd squawk, and. I'd practically jump over the railing myself. One time we were getting threats. People actually, uh, somebody shot at the station and then said, we're going to get you next time. And so we were all worried about what was going on. They never did figure out what the motive was or why anybody did that. But there was a time when uh, I know PJ Kirkland and I carried pistols to work. I got a license to carry a gun and and I'd open the door, because it'd be spooky, it'd be just like that. I'd open the door, maybe the lights weren't on in the inside, it, though. I'd open the door and I'd have my little pistol in my hand. I'd be walking around and, you know, and never did find anybody, fortunately. So, never fired the thing. But it was one of those spooky times. I always felt safer when I got on the air, because you could always yell for help if you had to. Always, always left the door unlocked. And the, the, part of the reason was I was stupid, maybe. But the other part is, if I locked it, I'd always forget to unlock it when the staff came in, and they'd walk around the side of the building and tap on the announcer's window and say, I want in, it's raining and windy, and my hair's blowing, and you, locked, you didn't unlock the door for me. And so that was probably the real reason. Also, there was a solitude doing my show. I uh, did most of my show alone. People would say, Dick, why don't you have a morning crew like all the other stations? Well, I, I just didn't like that. I felt more connected to my listeners if I was actually talking to them and not somebody else in the room. I could just feel the audience. There was a lady fixing Thanksgiving dinner, the farmer feeding his cows in the barn, the person who got to the office early and was sitting in their office alone. And I remember one guy, Fred Tilker, was one of my favorite listeners. And he died of cancer. And I'm getting the sign that says, start to wrap it up. we got about five minutes to go. But anyway, just before he died, he requested a song one more time that I played for him. And, and uh, it's just one of those things that you feel connected to your listeners. And, and that was what really made the job so great. And the, just before I left the station in 2011, I'd kind of gotten into a Saturday morning routine. I worked six days a week. And one of the things I like to do, every Saturday morning I'd go out and walk around the tower. I'd be picking up litter and trash too and needles and things. But anyway, I'd, I'd kind of look to the sky and I'd say, thank you, Lord, for such a great ride. This, you know, whether my job is today, is the last day of my job, or tomorrow, I don't know, but I've had a wonderful experience and I just, I'm so thankful. So I'd say that every day. And I want to use the last one here of our staff. Uh, 
We had a great staff. That's just part of the staff. There were about 10 people who didn't show up. They were doing different things. We counted about 30 people associated with the radio station. This was taken in 2007. And KGY always operated like a family. It was a great place to work, but it was more than just a place to work. It was, it was family. And, and I enjoyed every minute of it. And so I understand we're out of time. So we have a few minutes, uh, about five minutes for questions according to uh, TCTV here. And, and thank you, Dan, for, for the cues. And uh, so if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. And this is my first presentation like this. So, John. Very good question. Uh, John Alverson wanted to know what year this building went up. It was uh, 1960. 1960. I'd been at the Rockway Leland building about six months. Yes. What year did I graduate from Olympia High School? 1958. Thank you. I'm enjoying retirement, and I thank Mix 96.1 for uh, putting up with me and letting me do a show there. I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. Yes? Um... Yeah, we, I, I did a number of history uh, things, and I know Don Trosper uh, did a history series on KGY. I did a, a series, I, somebody was smart enough to record the construction of the building in sound, and so I replayed that on the air a couple of times, and that's a little different story, but that's when I was emphasizing to the port, which wanted to cancel the lease, that we were an important part of the port of Olympia and wanted to stay there. Yes? You, you know, the, uh, I talked to Gretchen Christopher with, did I ever interview the Fleetwoods when they were, they were down there was a question for uh, TCTV. Uh, Gretchen says, uh, Gretchen Christopher says that uh, uh, Come Softly was not recorded at KGY, that she cannot remember that being the case. Although uh, uh, PJ Kirkland, before he passed away, says that he introduced him down there. But Gretchen said she can't recall that for sure. So, uh, so I don't want to say that that actually happened. But they, yes, I interviewed Gretchen and the Fleetwoods several times. Yes? Well, as, as I mentioned before, KGY was a part of the community uh, to the extent that people had more than one radio in the house tuned to KGY. And it was just so wherever they went, KGY was broadcasting. It, I can't overemphasize the importance of that radio station in our community during that 50, 60 years. Things have changed since then, but... All right, one, one more question. What would you... Yeah, go ahead. Wow, that's impossible. How many listeners did I have? You know, it's one of those things you just kind of feel. And early ratings uh, at one point, uh, one of the surveys, and this might have been unbelievable, but uh, for the 7 o'clock news showed us with an unbelievable 70% uh, of the uh, radios tuned, turned on were listening to KGY. That seems like an awfully high figure, but maybe not. I don't know. It's possible. Yes? <laughs> I'll see if I can. Well, thank you very much for, for being here today. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And uh, we will be starting our new season of History Talks monthly in October. But don't forget to try to come to the, the Riverwalk tours throughout the summer months down, down at the Falls Park. Thank you so much.